Our first reading this morning is from the 49th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 to 7, found on page 596 in your pew Bible. Isaiah 49, 1 to 7. The servant of the Lord. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with the Lord. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, We met the Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel. To him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down. Because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 40, found on pages 451 of your Pew Bible. Psalm 40, psalm 40 page 451. I will read the odd verses if the congregation would respond and read. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and I heard my cry. He looked at me down as the sign you get. Out of my heart, my heart, you set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the crowd, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering to be my desire. Of my years you are open. Burnt offerings and sin offerings to be my fire. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do it. I will proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness in this kingdom. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May, you love, may your love and faithfulness always protect me. Praise be to God. Our second reading this morning is from the first First Corinthians chapter one, verses one to nine, found on pages nine twenty-three of the Pew Bible. First Corinthians chapter one, verse one to nine. Paul called to be an apostle, apostle of Christ, Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. 
Therefore, do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Our gospel this morning comes to us from John, the first chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. 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 I'll read John 1, 29 through 42. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came and baptized him with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see, the Spirit come down and remain is, the, is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Oh, as Paul says, grace and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus of Christ. I'm going to base my sermon this morning on our Corinthians reading. Now, you think about it. The world seems to have protests every day, don't they? The world is protesting something. Normal out of personal choices, isn't it? People argue and fight trying to have others respect their opinions, if no other word. It doesn't matter how ugly it gets either. <laughs> Because people feel they have the right to have things the way they want them. But as we know as God's children, as true children, there's only one right way. And we must look at everything and see how everything fits into God's perspective and God's law. And then humble our hearts to accept it. I guess that's probably the biggest problem we have in our world today. People don't want to accept that this is the way. They say, I'm changing it to my way, and if you don't like it, we'll fight it. But such goes on in the division of people. And the worst part is, is not only the pagans, as they were called in Jesus' day, but God's people too. And it's getting worse with the passage of time as the foothold of sin becomes stronger in our nation, in our world, in our cultures. So I ask, why should that be? Why must, must we be divided over everything? I mean, think about it. God created us in His image. 
were perfect in every way. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We're made in God's image. That's something we should be looking to for our guidance. Now, there are a couple of things I want, to, I want you to notice in that passage. You know, sometimes we read passages and we, we don't see the whole picture. He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. God was truly plural in the beginning, wasn't he? The creator. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit were here from the, in the beginning. Passages like this give us that, that truth. They give us that proof. Let us make mankind in our image. The other thing I want to point out is another very simple one. Where does it say that man is to rule over other men? Oh. Hmm. It doesn't. It says over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. Over the livestock and all the wild animals, over the creatures that move along the ground. Man was to rule over the lower creation. Not over each other. Now, I know the Old Testament. You know, I've been through the Bible a few times. Where God made made the request or gave the gave the request of man to have judges and kings and governments to rule over them. But the reason that was is because they would not follow God's plan. Think about it. Up to that time, until God was trying to guide them, and they kept arguing with him and saying, oh, no, we don't like this. They threw it on Moses' shoulders and said, Moses, we don't like this. But guiding us was always to be God's work. He made the rules, if we believe it or not. And there again, the division of people, whether we believe it or not. So we know the whole story from the beginning, the place where God's perfect plan was pushed aside. Now I know you've probably heard this story a million times, but here's a million and one. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crap than any other wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the servant, We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat from the, the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the servant said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. I can't repeat that story enough because that is right there the start of it all. The start of some of someone, Adam and Eve, the beginning of humans, following something or someone other than God following something other than the one who said, I will guide you and keep you. See, God's plan was perfect at the beginning. But Adam and Eve, like so many today, decided to do their own thing. And the problem with them, just like us, is we're not ready for the outcome. They weren't mature enough to see what they saw after it happened, were they? Good and evil are huge concepts. More than any one of us can understand. That's why I need God to guide us. Then you look at that, that passage again and you see it costs them and us our chance to live in paradise from beginning to end, didn't it? 
saw that? We were supposed to live in the Garden of Eden. The very beginning. Until man decided to do it his own way. Now, yeah, that's how simple our Bible can show it. And when you look at the moral of the story, it shows us that when we follow the wrong guide, when we follow the wrong leader, we will jeopardize the future of all coming generations. Think of that. Adam and Eve's choice to follow the serpent jeopardized every generation from there on. There again is why we need God. We need Jesus Christ as our Savior. See, our, our mistakes will multiply like fire. Sin is a never-ending evil. Sin somehow takes us out of God's plan. And God just keeps trying to get us on the right path. He keeps trying to clean up what we've done. That's why I sent Jesus to give us that one final chance to make it home. See, this life is bigger than just us. It's bigger than what we want or our plans or our what we say should happen. God's perfect plan has to be our goal. God's perfect way has to be in our minds. Or guess what? Our youth are doomed. Do we see it? Adam and Eve started it. We all got doomed. If we don't change this, our youth are doomed even farther. Which brings me to our reading in Corinthians this morning. Paul is telling the people from Corinth to look closely at who they were following. To be careful of who they said they were was in charge. Was it the true God and his word or someone who was trying to be God? Was it the truth or was it something like the serpent was doing? Twisting the truth to try to get, get the people to follow. You know, I love Paul's initial greeting. He makes the people feel welcome and wanted, doesn't he? He makes them feel connected. He brings the listeners into a comfortable place where they let their shields down. So that's the first step in talking to somebody. To gain their interest, to get their, their what to hear. And the thing we must realize is that's exactly what the serpent did to Eve. He talked to her in such a casual, understanding way. Not on your side, you know. See, we have to be aware of smooth talkers that try to convince, of, convince us of destroying ideas. We can be taken off guard if our eyes aren't open. If we lose our true north and forget what Jesus taught us, we too go down the wrong path. I mean, look at the scammers in our world today that convince people to go down this wonderful path of riches, which is a path straight into the pit. But people follow because of the words are so convincing. So that's why our Bible is such a great, great book. Paul's words this morning were trustworthy. He was truly doing work for Christ, wasn't he? It wasn't for him. He's only glorifying the name of Jesus, not his own. So that's a good gauge when we're wondering if what is said is true. Is it Jesus' real words, or is it man's words about Jesus? Is it the real truth or an opinion about the truth? 1 Corinthians 1 2. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. 
Nor in there does it say, for those people that are following me, Paul, or those people that understand what I want you to understand, it says, those people sanctified Jesus Christ and called me His holy people. See, the reason Paul got them to listen is because he knew what those people were taught in the beginning. It was the belief in Jesus Christ. The church, the people of God in Corinth, started as one body in the beginning. That's why they were there, because of what happened. But someone like the serpent came along and convinced them to believe something different. The divisions in belief in Jesus Christ, what we call religion today, started. People started following man's words instead of comparing it to the truth. I go to the verses right after what we read in the Gospel today. This is what I like to call a meat of Paul's letter. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. A church divided over leaders. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's house have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another says, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? If that ain't the meat of that letter, I don't know what is. Just 25 years after the crucifixion of Christ, that's when they figured this letter was written. Men had taken over religion again, hadn't they? The exact thing Jesus fought for through his whole ministry here. He fought against the things that men made up. That men said, well, this is how you get there. This is what you do. The exact same thing Jesus fought about that these people were so excited to get away from What's up there? What they were telling me? Go follow him now. Yeah, I get a little bit fired up about this because it's like, oh my God, you can't figure this out. It was destroying the whole picture of faith again. See, Jesus was no longer the center. It was just about, he was just a side dressing. Hey, come here. We talk about Jesus. Instead of coming here for Jesus and talking about other things. People were separating themselves over who they said they followed. Or maybe more importantly, just like the serpent, what others had convinced them to follow. Yeah. In our town of Seward, we have 13 churches. Six call themselves Luther. Five follow other denominations. Two claim no affiliation in it. How can that be? There is to be no division in the children of Christ. But you look at the division. We did that Bible study a couple years ago. The different religions. We believe in the inerrant word of God and instead of stopping with the word of God, it's the and. Our division comes from our own sin and our choice to say, I want it my way. I'll follow this way. I won't follow that way. I'll follow this way. And you know what? God knows I'm right. Just ask me. Or the great one. Our church is better than yours. We must be better. But guess what? Paul brings it home in verses 26 through 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. 
Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. That no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Think about that. We have trouble in this world. We boast in our religion, in our church, in our buildings. Go back to his reading when we're taught religion. We start as children, right? We have open minds and open hearts. But as we grow up, we develop opinion, and we develop opinions, destroy the pureness of faith. And it's normally led by the opinions of others. While they, they boast on the intelligence they have on the subject. Well, I'm a theologian. I know just what this stuff says. You guys don't know anything. Follow me because I can tell you. I'm Apollos. I'm Cephas. I'm the bishop. I'm the pope. Believe me, because I know there's that same words that Satan used in the garden. Convincing talk, deceiving words that lead us from unity with God. We must be aware of the influence of Satan. In the end, there is only one heaven, and Jesus is in charge. It's not a religion that's right to say, we have the way. And if you don't like how they do it, come over here and we'll let you do it your way. Jesus Christ is the only way. Yeah, I get real fired up about this because the, the more I say this, the more I work with it, the more I see how blind that people are and how blind I was. Because we follow. I have people tell me, well, oh, I can't come visit your church, Pastor Scott. I go across town. I said, say you should move here. I thought you should come visit. Oh, well, I can't do that because the other people will see that I didn't come that day. So? We can't see each other's churches? Well, you know, it's tradition. Well, boy, I sure hope God understands that. That you have to do it your way, not my way. That they're teaching something different across town than what should be taught. No. Paul said it straight out to the Corinthians. Figure out who you are. And that's what we have to ask ourselves here. Who do we follow? Like Paul's day? I follow Paul or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas? Is it I follow Luther or I follow Wesley or I follow the Pope? Or do I follow some smooth talking evangelist on the TV that says, send me your money. Don't worry about fellowship with fellow believers. Don't go to a church for strength. Just sit here and watch TV and send me your money. We've got to start figuring out who we are and who we're following. Do we follow Christ? If what you follow is the word of the Bible, you'll be saved. If you follow the words of religious men who make the word into something different than what Jesus said, you know, did God really say that? Did he really say that you can't do that? If you follow that, the answer may surprise you. Jesus says, believe me. Not just believe anything. Don't just declare you're a Christian. Because that's just a word. No, we have to get serious about this. 
My faith is not going to save you. Your faith isn't going to save me. But together we can strengthen each other's faith. When we get mad and say, I don't believe in the same God, I don't want to believe like you because my God says I don't have to. We might be in trouble. No, we need to look to the Bible and ask God for guidance through prayer. His Spirit will lead us if we let it. And I say the peace you find will be beyond, be beyond understanding. No. The world's never going to be one as we know it because of our sin. Because our sin has outdone God over and over and over in the Bible. You notice that? It never knocks him down completely, but it take, takes people away from him over and over again. Christ calls us to be with him and all of him. To humble our hearts and to follow his word. It's each, up to each one of us to start looking deep inside and deciding who do we follow? Because I guarantee you, God is going to be on the judgment. And we go to him and say, it isn't fair. He's going to say, I gave you everything I could to teach you the way. And you went your own. No, we're called to be one forever in Christ alone. Let's look really close. As I say, I'm not here to save you. I'm here to help you find the way to be saved. Because I'm on the same path too. The difference is, is God gave me a job to. Well, I, I think of Isaiah a lot. You read Isaiah, he was a pretty tough, tough old bird. He was a prophet in times where people said, We want to do it our way, and you just stay out. And Isaiah stood and said, This is what God says, this is what he says. If you follow it, or you won't be in. That's what a true preacher is supposed to be doing these days. A true preacher says it the way it is. Because if I lead you down the wrong path, if my smooth words and my good talking take you into a place you shouldn't be, I'll be in the deepest part of hell if there's any kind of levels. I ain't going to do that. Because I want you to find out. I'll tell you, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I know it's hard sometimes for people to hear the truth. Our churches are preaching what people want to hear. So they can build big buildings and have big coffers and say, look how huge we are. But if you really look at what they're following, it's not the Bible. Jesus had no place to stay, no place to lay his head. He didn't spend hours praying for money and praying for a church and praying for a building. He slept in tents and didn't worry about all that stuff. Our faith has went into a direction that worries me. And I know we're not supposed to worry, but as a pastor I worry. But as a pastor, I know, Lord Jesus, I have to give it back to you. Please guide us and keep us and keep us on the right path. When it gets tough and it gets hard, help us to humble our hearts and swallow instead of spewing out what we think we want to have it our way. When people ask us who we follow, have us say we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord, not a religion. Religion separate, Christ unites. One path goes to hell, one path goes to heaven. Help us to find the right path. Oh Lord Jesus, we just pray this all in your holy name. Amen.
And I'll just share some prayers. The most important thing we can do in our lives every day is talk to our God. Oh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive us. Please forgive our sin like you did Adam and Eve when they decided to do it their own way. Heavenly Father, we, we let our sin slide in and guide us down paths that have no, no good. And our sin makes us boastful and strong about it. But Lord, on that final day, dear Heavenly Father, on that final day when our eyes close for the last time in these, in these sinful human bodies, and we open to you, we want you to say, welcome. You believed. You did your best. You followed. You weren't perfect, but you tried. And you gave your heart to me. Heavenly Father, it's a hard thing to do. Oh, we have sin in our hearts. We ask you to watch over us. Continue to give us our daily bread. Continue to give us our mornings and our evenings. Continue to give us the air we breathe and everything we have. Because none of us made this ourselves. Heavenly Father, you are God. And we are your children. Show us the way. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Lord Jesus, you came, as I said, with nothing to your name, not a place to lay your head, but you never stopped your mission. Because your mission was to lead people to the Father in heaven, to get them past the human leaders that were saying, this is how you do it. And when the human leaders didn't like what you said, they let their sin overtake them and kill you. That's how ugly sin gets. We're going to make it our way no matter what we have to do. We'll stop our feet. We'll protest. We'll hurt each other to have it our own way. But we never look back to the law, the Ten Commandments. Lord Jesus, you came and gave us everything to be our final guide home, to be our Lord and Savior. You came and said, I'll take the sting of their sin away. But we must follow you and trust in you to do that. Oh, Lord Jesus, we're going to share a meal you gave us to remember you, to remember that you came to help us through. To get us past the worldly leaders and the worldly religious people that said, follow me because I'm the way. Lord Jesus, help us to remember you are the way, the truth, and the light. No matter what our opinions are, you will decide the yeah. end. Oh Lord Jesus. Help us to love you like you love us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And finally, Holy Spirit, the power, the power that was given to us in our hearts, that conscience that we have that tells us when we do things wrong, we're wrong. The thing we were given to overcome our sin. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to help people to get over their worldly opinions, their worldly sinful desires, their desires of the flesh, and drive them into places. Holy Spirit, I ask you to help us find the way before it's too late. Holy Spirit, you are the one that takes our prayers to our Heavenly Father. You are a part of us. You know our minds. You know our souls. 
Guide us and keep us in Jesus' way. Oh God, our triumphant God, you have went to every level to try to get us to understand. Again, please help us humble our hearts and follow you. And understand that it isn't about this world. It's about finding peace. God, we just give you, give you all of our sorrows and all of our our joys. We just give it all of you. We ask you to help us sort it out and be on one path. Because the old ways are working. But our sinful ways keep us on the old path because this is the way we've always done. God, show us a new path that we can walk with you. That we can put our hand in yours and be your children. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just give it all to you. And we ask for your forgiveness and your peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.